have that, you know, that everyone's not fed by this point in our evolution, you know, know. with the science, the science we have and well, communication we have. Well, you just project a little bit more with your freaking out. Sure. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Okay, see if we can start off where we left off. Um, so the word, the name Food for Life, even there's a, a very significant meaning behind that name Food for Life, why we selected that name. Because food for life, life meaning the spiritual part of our being. So this is real food, for the, not only for the body, but for the spirit as well. And all the food that's prepared by Food for Life volunteers is prepared with love, very carefully, in a very pristine environment. We try to um, prepare the meals in, in the cleanest possible environment with a clean consciousness, we, when we select the produce, when we're cutting the vegetables, when we're washing the vegetables, we're thinking positive thoughts. And the whole purpose being that this is really a sacrifice. We're making an offering here. This is a gift from, from the earth, from God. And now let's prepare this beautiful meal, thank God, offer this, and then distribute it to uh, the people. So it's, it's nourishing for the body and the soul. And people taste it. People really taste it. They, they notice the difference. They'll come up and they'll say, how did you make that thing? You know, what's the recipe? And we'll say, well, just, it's, this is just the way we work. Um, so during the tsunami, uh, it was a very amazing experience for all of us at Food for Life. We had at least six to 700 people from around the world offering to volunteer for our organization. And obviously we just couldn't handle so many. Um, but we took quite a few from different countries. They, they made their own way there. Uh, we provided shelter for them and, and food and board. And they volunteered, helped us to prepare uh, tens of thousands of meals. And the unique thing about Food for Life during the tsunami was that, first of all, we were the first responder. We were actually the first agency to start feeding people. The very day the tsunami hit, Three hours after it hit, we were feeding people. Uh, you won't hear about it in the news. We're sort of under the radar, but we're there. We're always there doing something because we're very flexible. We're a um, grassroots operation, so we, we can move very quickly. So we were there actually three hours after the tsunami feeding people in the south uh, coast of India. Um, and the unique thing about our program was is the food was freshly cooked. It was a type of food that people like to eat. Uh, it was rice and dal and vegetables with a lot of chili and the people were in ecstasy they just loved it because what they had been receiving before that was um, something which they couldn't understand it was either dried crackers or some dry foods and they didn't understand what that was how to how to eat that and then we came and we provided them a fresh meal which was more um, something they could understand and, and they loved it so we set up kitchens around the island. We had, a, we had uh, temporary kitchens in the south, east, west, and north. We cooked on firewood. We had big pots, and uh, we cooked rice and dal and sabji, and um, we were working with the military. And there was a very unique way that we provided the food. We would actually prepare the food and then wrap it in plastic bags, then wrap it in newspaper in little packages and then hand out the packages and that was a military way of doing it. And we found it very efficient because it kept the food very hot and we were able to transport the food very easily around different parts of the island. Uh, the problem with the tsunami is that people were spread out so logistically it was very challenging to feed people. It was one of the big problems. People were so spread. We're used to people being in one concentrated area but with the tsunami you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of miles of devastation and as I was mentioning earlier that Three quarters of the coastline of Sri Lanka was actually devastated. So after three or four weeks of food distribution, uh, we um, decided to concentrate our efforts on our orphanage uh, project, which is in Colombo, and it's called Gokulam, and it's a wonderful project. Uh, the children have been taken care of so nicely by Nandarani, and she is really just an angel, and the children see her as mother. And if you've never been there, you have to go there because it's, you have to experience it. It's incredible. Nandarani started this project just out of the goodness of her heart. She saw some children on the street. She brought them into the temple. She was running a little Hindu temple in the center of Colombo. 
She brought them in, started feeding them. That then expanded. She rented an apartment, continued to get more children, helping them. And then eventually it became a big project. And she got land, someone donated land, she got a proper building. And now there's 120, 130 children, all getting first class care, three meals a day, full education, medical care, and they're so happy. And as you can see in the, in the documentary. Um, what else do you talk about? Uh, how, about where, how about how you got started? The beginning? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll the beginning. Um, so Food for Life actually began in the 70s, and it began in India when a Swami known as Swami Prabhupada, he saw some children fighting, some village children fighting over scraps of food with dogs. And he was so hurt by this that he told his yoga students, no one should go hungry like this. This is not right. Uh, where there is a, you know, God is the father, where there, the, where there is a temple or any church, no one should go hungry. So he asked his yoga students to begin feeding these children and that began what is now known as the Food for Life program. The project spread all over the world. We now currently have more than um, 100 projects in 50 countries. We're serving approximately 450,000 meals every single day at a rate of five meals every second. Um, and again, it's all freshly cooked meals. And so far to date, since the early 70s, we've served about 350 million meals. If you go to our website, you can see a little counter, a little food counter, you can see the meals ticking over. It's quite, quite interesting. Um, now, since that program began, we have expanded into many different services. Primarily, the foundation of the program is food relief, uh, freshly cooked meals, and it's always vegetarian, and we b believe strongly that a vegetarian diet is not only healthier, but it is more efficient, it is better for the environment, in many different ways it is, is it a, a better way to feed people. Uh, but we've expanded into many other services including some medical services, orphanages, um, we have some sustainable agriculture, uh, some s sustainable farming communities where we're providing food, produce for the Food for Life programs. We have some counselling services um, and of course emergency relief, that's an important part of our, uh, our efforts as well. We were there during the uh, Katrina relief, again a first responder. The very next day after Katrina hit, we had teams in Mississippi feeding people, organic vegan meals. And of course we cooked according to taste. We, we don't just serve everybody rice and curries or whatever, we cook, we cook according to taste. So for the Katrina uh, survivors, we were providing them um, pasta, uh, some chili, vegetarian chili, um, semolina, uh, strawberry pudding, uh, cakes, or whatever, but it was all vegetarian and it was healthy and they loved it. We even got a letter from the Red Cross saying this is the best meal she's ever experienced and um, she said the people were crying in happiness that they would, they'd never had such good food and even it was the best food they'd ever had in their whole life so that's the sort of response that we get from the food we serve. Um, well, all these facts are so great. I can't yeah. believe the number of meals. That's <laughs> mind blowing. Five meals a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about how this work affects you emotionally? Yeah. Um, um, what, should we avoid it as a question? Um, uh, how, do, how does. How does this how does this work of seeing all this suffering uh, or I mean is it suffering basically that you get to see or we get to well you know more but you know what we get to see is more happiness we're bringing smiles to people I mean right yeah this is the effect of food I mean I could talk about that okay. um, the reward that I personally get is that I just see happiness I see people smiling the food that we're serving just lighten, lights people up. They really, really appreciate it. And it's not ordinary food. The food is cooked with love. It's very clean, very pure food, and people really do taste it. And um, again, we're trying to unite the world through food. This is, 
the, the tagline for Food Flow Global is uniting the world through food because we believe we have a peace formula that through this distribution, liberal distribution of pure vegetarian food, we can bring peace and prosperity to the world and we're actually physically, practically seeing that and it's very rewarding. Uh, I see smiling children, um, just children that are suffering so much in the most difficult circumstances suddenly smiling and happy seeing that someone cares about them and there's nothing better than food for translating for transferring that you know that 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 love did you have uh what, what is your personal background uh and how did you get involved yeah do you want to talk about that or just uh is there anything in your life that that when you were younger that you kind of knew you were on some sort of path uh, for this type of work? I think, well, uh... Was it, it, was it part of your childhood at all? Or, uh, I mean, not only, I don't know, it wasn't actually, I mean, not only really as much as my father was always very interested in feeding people coming to our house. He was always going out of his way to feed people. So I guess I picked that up from him. And that's become like my life's mission, is to feed people, is to just feed as many people as I can. <laughs> um, um, but I don't know. Uh, no, it's very interesting. I got involved in, in Food for Life when I was about 19. Um, and I began doing some service for a local charity. And I just immediately picked up on it. And of course, from my childhood, my father always set that example of wanting to feed people. And then learning more about Food for Life and where Food for Life came from, it has roots in India and as I mentioned earlier, the Vedic culture of hospitality, the, the traditional Indian culture of hospitality. And the hospitality was again based on a spiritual understanding that we're all equal. And it went so far as that people would typically, after they prepared their meal, they would go outside and actually call out, is anybody hungry? Is anybody hungry? Please come and eat. And then only after everyone had been satisfied, then would the, lo the, the man or the, the woman actually take their meal. That's the culture that this food flow program was born from. Um, there's another interesting part of the culture. It's called Atiti Narayan. This is a Sanskrit um, word. Atiti means without schedule, Atiti. And Narayan is another name for God. So Atiti Narayan means the unexpected guest that person that comes unscheduled, you should treat them like God. That's the culture which Food for Life was born from. And this is what we're trying to you know, distribute to the world. We feel very strongly that we have a, a wonderful gift here. And through this program, not only can we feed hungry bellies, but we can bring happiness and we can bring people together. And I've seen it. I've been to war zones. I've been to all sorts of terrible, devastated, uh, scenarios and uh, I've seen how it brings light and happiness to people. It works. That's a pretty good ending phrase. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been to I've been to Grozny in Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. I got some amazing stories in Grozny. So you must have stories galore. I was trying to because it's hard to remember them all, but I've got a lot of stories. Trying to think. Actually, I can tell you one in Grozny. Yeah. Did you, do you know Chechnya, Grozny, the war? Um, a little, just the basics okay. that everybody else knows, I guess. Let me tell you about that. Um, a fascinating story is one of one fascinating story came from our efforts to help the people in Grozny, Chechnya, during the war in the early 90s. Food for Life was the only NGO in that city providing meals. Even the Red Cross wouldn't go in, it was so dangerous. They provided us raw food, we went in and were cooking the meals and serving people. We took over an abandoned kitchen in a school and we had six volunteers there from, from Moscow. Um, all qualified professional people, bankers, doctors, they came down and volunteered for Food for Life. And we set up a little kitchen, a little shelter there and they stayed there for two years. I visited them during the middle of this period for about two to three weeks. I went down there to arrange some, some help for them. 
I met with the president of Chechnya to try to get some more funding for the project. But these men and women were just so dedicated, it was just incredible, their efforts, because it was so dangerous. Literally, there was fighting going on right around them. They told me one story, uh, one time there was Chechen soldiers and Russian soldiers fighting in the same courtyard where they had the kitchen. And bullets were flying over the building, a couple of them went through the window and they were just lying on the ground and praying, hoping that they would be okay. But because of the work they were doing, the soldiers were actually very careful to not, you know, to not hurt them. So they were f providing fresh meals and the people were there were so touched that as they walked along the road, the, the women, the Muslim women would bow down and praise them. And a New York Times reporter actually came to uh, observe this program and he was so amazed that he wrote a, a beautiful article page four of the New York Times in 1995 and in that article he said um, the people here it's not hard finding people to swear that these people to swear that they're saints they have a reputation like uh, Mother Teresa has in Calcutta this is what he said of the Food for Life volunteers they have a reputation like Mother Teresa has in Calcutta people were so appreciative Tears to my eyes. Oh, wow. So they were, yeah, and one, actually one of the boys, one of the boys actually was killed during that time. Um, he was serving meals to a hospital and the Russian, Russian helicopter shot a missile into the hospital and the shrapnel cut his leg and he, he bled to death. So we had one casualty. But they were there for two years serving. Again, under the radar, you don't hear about it. Of course, the New York Times picked up a story, but other than that, a lot of the time,